so what I'd like to start off before um, we read a few pages from the book is to talk about some of the examination the community has had to uh, begin to to do as we really look at what kind of a leader has, has Christine Quinn been for this community? What has pushed people to to not only say she, you know, I'm not going to vote for her, but then to take on the added role of being an activist, to take on responsibilities and to take action to actually vote her out of office, which is different from just saying I'm not going to vote for her. Um, th there's more that people have to do in order to vote somebody out of office rather than, other than just saying, I'm not going to vote for her. Um, when I close this, I think it's, um, if I just keep it open. Um, so, as I began to do my research, um, what pushed me to, to write this book, um, was, I guess, over a year ago when I found out that Christine Quinn was going to write her own memoir. Um, and I found out who the editor was, uh, Henry Ferris, from, from I believe, Harper Collins. Um, I forget the publishing house. It's the one that's associated with Fox. Um, and I realized what was going to, what was going to happen. This was going to be a one-sided story um, that was going to be a glamour story. Uh, she was going to gloss over everything that all of us had been, that she was going to gloss over everything that had driven us to activism, uh, which is basically almost what she did. Um, I haven't read her book uh, deliberately, um, but I'm told that um, it's very shallow. And I, and I can believe it because she doesn't want to talk about her record. And I don't, I'm not making that as a character judgment about her personality. I'm saying I think this was deliberate on her part. She, she's trying to avoid her record. Um, and so before I read these few pages to you, I think the one remarkable thing that, has, that I've discovered um, in the last year or so is is the courage that so many people within the LGBT community has in order to come forward and speak out against Christine Quinn. Um, there are a lot of people in this room and outside um, who are not here this evening who are going contrary to what we traditionally call identity politics. That people in the LGBT community just support a candidate just because of their um, that they're identified LGBT. And this time, there's such a huge outpouring of criticism of Speaker Quinn from this community. That takes a lot of courage. You know, when I speak about the, the different levels of, of work that people take on, people start within the role that they have in life, whether you're a nurse, like Nurse Dunn, and you take on activism, you take on the role of being a community organizer, um, whatever extra actions you take to fulfill on on the change that you want to see in the city, all that, if you add on top of that going contrary to what, to, to, you know, if you go contrary to the peer pressure that we have in this community, community just to support this new plan solely because she's, she may be um, the first lesbian mayor in the city. It, it takes a lot of courage to do all this. So I acknowledge everybody who's here who has the courage to speak up against her. Um, I'm going to read a few pages. Um, and I want to just preface this by saying, um, just a few minutes ago I told you um, that in the time when I first started getting active around the closing of St. Vincent's, I met a few activists. I named Susanna, I mean, I named Donnie, I mentioned the Pieta Perlin. Um, but as I did research for this book, I found out 
that people have been speaking out against Christy Quinn from the very beginning of her career. It wasn't something that just began because of St. Vincent's. I think St. Vincent's was a flashpoint for the community where people said, we're not going to take this anymore. But there were episodes like this before in Christine Prince's career. Um, I'm going back in time now, probably almost 20 years now. This was when Christine Quinn um, was named executive director of the Anti-Violence Project. This was a very daring group um, here in New York City doing pioneering work. At the time that she took over, uh, there was an executive director who was leading. Um, he had done a lot to, to move that, that agency forward. And Christine Quinn came in and she had to basically um, spin it as an immediate success story because she was on a path to run for public office. Everything in her career has been very calculated. Um, nothing's been left up to chance. So I'm going to read from the beginning on the bottom of page 9 if you have a copy. If not, you can just follow with me. I'm only going to be reading a few pages. One of Christine's self-described early successes was shrouded in some controversy. While she was executive director of ADP, that's the Anti-Violence Project, Christine claimed to have not only expanded its range of programs and services, but also increased awareness of biased crimes nationwide. The back channel talk was that Christine reorganized the agency by purging the staff one person said, another person said that what Christine did was to professionalize the agency in order to qualify for grants. For example, no case notes were kept, one source said, offering one example of what Christine was confronting. And Christine's challenges in staff were part of her efforts to improve the agency. Again, whenever people were approached to speak about Christine's record, there was a sensibility expressed about being the target of ret retaliation from Christine. Those who would speak requested anonymity, but many people refused to speak at all. Notwithstanding the back channel rationalizations, Christine would be criticized years later for the way she dismissed the staff of ABP during the agency's reorganization, which would cast doubt on the storyline about Christine's reforms. Christine needed swift success at ADP in order to parlay that gig into a greater personal opportunity. But Christine was courting trouble by claiming to need to professionalize ADP. Christine was implying that the agency needed improvement when she took over, which was far from the truth. And here in the late, sorry, and here in the tale of what happened at ADP was the beginning of what would become to be described as a manufactured early success for Christine, which she needed to have happen in order to begin to, to lay the groundwork for a myth about herself. Christine's term at ADP was critical to her career. Christine would understand at ADP the tremendous pressure caused by nonprofit fundraising. Nonprofits faced outsized influence. Nonprofits faced outsized influence from their benefactors and the members of the boards of directors who are responsible for raising money. The pressure by one board member is allegedly what would lead Christine to hire his young lover, multiple sources told me. This hiring, in connection with Christine's purging of the expert staff at ABP, would lead to a great controversy amongst LGBT activists. But ADP didn't just have paid staff, it also had trained volunteers who answered the hotlines because ADP was providing critical services to LGBT victims of violence and hate crimes. The disruption caused by Christine's changes to ADP staff was having an impact on the morale of those who remained working and volunteering there and among the community and among the activist community who appreciated the valuable role of ADP 
to the public and personal safety of LGBT New Yorkers. At this very early point in Christine's career, LGBT activists in Chelsea and Greenwich Village began to question her judgment. It wasn't that she was trying to add her own stamp to ADP, but that she was jamming the agency's smooth continuity. ADP did critical work, and Christine was disrupting it. Matt Foreman, Christine's predecessor at ADP, was described by more than one person as being a very accomplished leader, and he was and he was subsequently, I'm sorry, and he has subsequently had an impeccable and principled record of successfully managing leadership roles at many LGBT agencies. Indeed, after his impressive record at ADP, Matt Foreman went on to serve as the as the executive director of the Empire State Pride Agenda, and then of the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force, Mr. Foreman has had was such a successful nonprofit executive that he more than doubled the budget at the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force during his five-year term. This was the kind of a leader ADP had before Christine Flynn got there. He was very dynamic. Not only that, but Mr. Foreman was a founding member of the Heritage of Pride, the group under which the LGBT Pride events are organized in New York City. Under Mr. Foreman, ADP formed working relationships with ACT UP and Queer Nation to bring about necessary reforms to the point where Mr. Foreman even engaged in civil disobedience. Activists knew and trusted Mr. Foreman, they, who they knew was real, and these activists began to see how Christine's efforts to fluff her own track record were having the effect of throwing Mr. Foreman, who was highly respected in the LGBT community, under the bus. The myth being propagated as a result of Christine's changes was that she was transforming ADP from an amateur-run, volunteer-based organization into a professionalized agency. This myth contradicted the pioneering and extensive same-sex anti-violence counseling, anti-bias, I'm sorry, anti-bias awareness training, and community outreach work being done by existing staff members such as Chris Drum and Mara Barely, among others. Not only that, but Mr. Foreman oversaw ADP's role in making the NYPD more sensitive to bias violence against the LGBT community. There were remarkable gains being made by ADP under Mr. Foreman and before him under his predecessor, David Wertheimer. This was during a time when not only homophobia was increasingly leading to violence, but phobia about HIV and AIDS was also triggering a backlash against the LGBT community. All the talk from Christine and her team about her need to professionalize ABT was unfairly casting aspersions upon the good name of Mr. Foreman and others. It was uncomfortable but necessary for Mr. Foreman, Mr. Wertheimer, and some of ABT's former associates to speak out. Sometimes through letters to the editor of LGBT publications, which no longer exist, to clarify ADP's successes prior to Christine's arrival. ADP had been a daring and effective agency since its, since its inception. But the desperate energy with which Christine was trying to force immediate success at ADP, unfortunately, was playing out publicly, and her, and her management style was rubbing people the wrong way, some, some observed. This episode at ADP would begin to sow the seeds of suspicion and mistrust amongst activists of Christine's motivations and machinations. In spite of efforts to correct the misconception that Christine was espousing, her myth would go henceforth. Christine purged the staff and instituted her own changes at ADP, and she brandished these changes as necessary in order to lead to success. This and her and her prolific photo opportunities and media sound bites during her tenure at ABP helped Christine to propagate her myth as a successful leader. And I want to talk about this for a second. Um, I was going to read some more. I want to stop there. Um, research from my volume one inspired um, a reporter at the New York Times named, named Michael Grimbaum. Michael Grimbaum. He wrote a front page story um, 
about Christine's conflicted time as a leader at ABP. He mentioned a lot of this, but in, in summary. And the lead to that article, still to this day, there is this misconception that ADP was a scraggly, volunteer-based organization that needed to be professionalized. To this day, Christine's um, stamp of, of what she did at ADP is still to, toward the narrative that she insisted it needed to have to have in order to portray for her to have had a, a successful tenure at ADP. So in, in, spite of, in spite of the fact that there are people who, who had to defend their record, defend their um, defend the contributions they made to ADP, still to this day, there, there is still this misconception that when Christine Crane ran that agency, what, she, what the end result was, um, was that she professionalized that agency. Um, Sorry. Can you? I just wanted to ask if you, like, why did she leave? Like, she's only there for two years. Why did she end up leaving? She, she, she ended up leaving ABP, I believe, in order to run for a city council. Um, oh, I see. Those are the first, Tom Dwayne. Yeah. But um, I'm told that at her court, she loses her 
number very easily. Um, and it's been a challenge to put together research about her her time as a, as a young activist in the city. But I think a lot of what we see today can be traced back to what happened at APP. A lot of people have said that to me. Um, and um, it's interesting, the video I was going to show you today, um, I was going to try to draw a larger picture about what does it mean to have like a second chance in public life. Um, I don't know how many chances have we given Speaker Clinton. She ran ADP to such, an, to such a degree that um, she fired people who disagreed with her. People, people resigned rather than try to work things out with her. Um, after they left, people had to write letters to the editor to defend their time at that agency, to defend their record, to defend their contribution, to, de to defend what they thought that agency was all about. I think those were the last group of people who publicly spoke out against her. As soon as she got into office, um, uh, except for a few more occasions after that, um, a few more flashpoints, people didn't have the courage anymore. Um, we saw one with the episode of St. Vincent's recently. Um, there was a time before that um, when the NYPD unilaterally instituted a parade permit requirement. People spoke out against Christine Klein over that. Um, and then right after she did win the election, um, some people in, in Greenwich Village spoke out against her, her management style. There have been a few occasions, but there haven't been many. Um, there are few and far between. Uh, and, and trying to get all this on the record is not easy. Um, Sure. The black community has been blasted away a couple of times. Barry also, the Sunny Carson thing, when they tried to change the street uh, to a uh, black activist, right. he wanted to, and the black community, but I, I was there at that hearing, so you're ignoring the whole. Uh, uh, major source about it. No, 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 no,
has fallen in for and repeats on the front page of the largest newspaper in the city. It's a story mine. It's a narrative. And as, as, as I said, nothing around her is as an accident. Everything is calculated. Um, you know, here, here we are in one of the only bookstores that, that, are, that is carrying this underground pamphlet. I mean, th this is as, as organic and grassroots as you can get. And so it, it's up to us to decide what are we going to believe. I just wanted to ask you, I can't find out anywhere where she worked right after she ran Tom Boyd's campaign. It was like a five-year period that she was not employed. And I was just like, what? Okay, well, after... After after uh, she ran Tom Wayne's 1991 campaign, she worked for him at city council. What? She she worked at city council. The chief of staff. She, she was his chief of staff. I see. Um, right. So, so she went from community organized, or she was a housing advocate. And for six she, months. Um, and she became a campaign manager for Tom Wayne. That, so that's directly like. I don't believe so. Um, I don't know what she could have done for money. But and I mean, when did she go to, she, was, she worked for Tom Boyd and then she went to ADP for two years and then she ran for the county. That's it. That, that's the trajectory I think that her career has, has taken, yes. Um, she had the support of Donald Manis and the Queen's Democratic Club, which is something that most people don't talk about, right. and his style of politics is what she adopted. Right. It's not progressive. Right, and he, he's the one who was key to her appointment uh, as speaker. Um, I think the people, oh, sir, going back to your book for a minute, I think that the people who are best equipped to talk about how destructive a force Christie Quinn has been are the ones who have the most to lose by speaking out against her. And so that's why all of us have been you know, struggling to get people in positions of power to speak out against what they know is this horrible, quote, public servant. Uh, but I think it's interesting that uh, Quinn wrote a book that was on and covered in the New York Times several times, and it only sold 100 and something copies. What do you, what do you make of that? Like, why is that? It's, it's remarkable, really. It's a remarkable. Um, um, it's fabulous. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, one of my friends is here. Um, he knows. Uh, I worked on. Um, I worked on trying to promote a book several years ago. It was a controversial book, and it was a flop, probably on uh, along the lines of Quinn's own book. And I only have. I have like, if I were to speculate about what really happened. I, I think I have two excuses or two possible explanations to, to explain why her book failed so miserably. Um, the first, the first is the most obvious reason, which is Christine Quinn is not a compelling figure. I, I think after being in city council for 15 years, uh, it just goes to show you this woman has no bridges. She's built no bridge in with. With, with no community in the city. She has no platform. Um, and I knew something was wrong a couple years ago, or last year, I forget when, when Christine Quinn tried to run out Chick-fil-A from NYU. Um, Christine found herself at the losing end of a very flawed argument, number one. She was trying to violate um, the free speech rights of the CEO, the owner of Chick-fil-A, um, because she didn't like it, she was going to try to have them shut down or run out, you know, run out of uh, NYU. And as flawed as the, as her effort was, no one rose to her defense. She found herself being criticized um, by the editorial board of the New York Times um, on on New York One. And there was no group, there was no group that ran to her defense. Uh, there was, I think, a couple protests outside of Chick-fil-A around that controversy, but nobody came to Christine's defense. The, the, there's, no, there's no group here in New York City called 
you know, um, radical activists in support of Christine Quinn's agenda. I mean, she has no group. There's nobody here in this city. Which points to the larger failure on her part, which is she has no vision. She ha she offers us no vision, and as a consequence, there's, she has no following. And, and the only reason I can think of why her book fails miserably is because no one is invested in, in the dream that Christine Quinn has for herself. If, if people really had an emotional investment or a connection to her as a person, people would be motivated. I would have bought her book if I cared about her. But I don't think she, she's made any real connection with anybody in the city. That's my first, that's my first reason. You have another question? Oh, I just, uh, you know, yes, she's not, she's not compelling. Uh, if you take a, take a look at her record and what she's accomplished and how she's run the city, uh, but because she has so much money, today we learned that she has control of 80% of the city's discretionary funds, which are, amounts to almost $400 million a year that she has at her disposal. That's a lot of money where she can buy support, endorsements, silence, campaign contributions, and that's, just, that's, that's where her support comes from, from the money that she's used to buy it with. Just, just look at the rally that took place that she sponsored when the young African-American gay man was murdered on Christopher Street. Every single speaker that was chosen was people that she had given money to. And it became a pride rally rather than a rally about violence or a rally about guns. And local community people and community activists were not allowed to speak. I just want to repeat what Jim said uh, for the people in the back. Um, there was a recent um, incident of a biased killing in the West Village, and at the rally that the community had uh, that the community had to go to, Christine organized it, and she chose who got to speak. And, the, and Jim is saying that the people who got chosen to spoke were people who she had donated money to, and that uh, community activists were denied the opportunity to address the issues. And the most important issues about guns and violence were not the subjects that were discussed at, at that rally. So this is, you know, because she's trying to, um, because she's trying to exploit all, she's trying to find ways to exploit the entire community for her own benefit. This is one way that she thwarts us from making any progress on all the underlying issues that keep the city either from making any progress, that keep us divided, that keep us back, that, that um, she's, her, 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 her attempts to exploit the community keeps us from making any progress. Yes? An example of our exploitation is when they reported on the rally, they announced that
what you serve. It's a very interesting article, and I'll point out with this a couple of uh, years ago, and they, they, did, they, they, they did an analysis of campaign contributions, and they found out that of all the people, she took in more money from the real estate community than all the other candidates combined. Right. I think the biggest threat in not to her, right? Like, she was riding for behind the polls. Um, you know, you wonder where that 32 percent came from. But as soon as interestingly enough, Anthony Weiner, with all his peculiarities and the race, from polls blocked. And all of a sudden, he came up. So she is totally pissed off with him. Okay. So what, what the other candidates have to do? I mean, whoever gets into the, the runoff against her, that's where the race is going to be. I think it's sort of the you know, lose. You can lose and you can have to think the hell out of it. But anyway, uh, but the point that I'm trying to stress is that the death of the concern and opposition to her extends way beyond the uh, no, no, yes, of course. Of right. And right. the civil rights community is right. a big Right, I know, I know. She's made a lot of enemies. Uh, do you have a question? Yeah, I want to go back to your book and your research. Um, do, did you cover any of the things that she did about limiting the right to assembly, the way she built fences along West Street and Hudson Park Trust during Pride, the way she has made that, that the actual Pride march into something which is frightening after 6 o'clock with the way the police populate the West Village. Did any of your research talk about that? Um, I haven't gotten to it yet, um, but there's going to be a discussion. Um, this is volume one. There's going to be four volumes. Um, there's going to be talk about how Christy Quinn has never stood up to the NYPD. Um, one very common um, complaint that a lot of people have is that we live under conditions that resemble a police state in the city. And Christy Quinn, like the gentleman said in the back, if we don't, if we broaden our perspective on her and 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 pull out uh, on the LGBT focus and look at the broader perspective, she ran as a progressive candidate. Um, you know, there are progressive values that she claimed she represented to the community 15 years ago when she first ran for city council. All that was cheap talk because today she doesn't believe in it. And like Jim is pointing out, um, you know. We live, we live under conditions where our use of public space is restricted. Um, that space that belongs to the people, and Christine Quinn doesn't stand up for our right to use that space. Um, you know, she doesn't stand up for anything. And, and I think I think various different communities in the city have have zeroed in on that sensibility after 15 years of her being in public office. I think everyone is, is wise to her, and the main, the, the, you know, this goes back to why did her book fail? People in the city don't have an investment in her. Not only do they not have an investment, but on some level, I think every community in the city has has felt betrayed by her. Certainly, the people who live in the West Village over the closing of St. Vincent's Hospital, uh, the, pe the you know, the people in in the outer boroughs, if you want to use that term. Because Christine Quinn um, never stood up to NYPD over stop and frisk. I mean, there are minority communities outside of Manhattan who are upset about it. I'm sure there are people here in Manhattan who are as well. Um, I think you know um, there are communities outside of the LGBT community that have multiple reasons to, to feel uh, critical about Christine Quinn's career, and you know, I, I think. If she's willing to betray the LGBT community, frankly, you know, she's willing to throw anybody under the bus at this point just to become elected. Coney Island, if you look at what, what she did in the destruction and turning her back to support the mayor and the land use committee, Amanda Burden, in the destruction of Coney Island for real estate. I mean, she's consistently done that destroying neighborhoods. It's been the Bloomberg plan, and she's been right there with him. Right. Now, uh, what Jim said was, uh, Jim was criticizing uh, Christine Quinn's role in, in, the, the, in the gentrification and destruction of Pony Island. And I'll, talk, I'll just mention this one piece. It, this is not in volume um, one, but it's in volume three of my book. Um, before she became city council speaker, uh, around 2003, 2004, 
Christine Quinn was very visible in the fight to defeat the West Side Stadium. Um, and she got a lot of mileage out of you know, standing up to the mayor. This was under Gifford Miller, when Gifford Miller was speaker. She got a lot of mileage out of holding press conferences, holding rallies. Um, there were multiple town halls in, in um, Hell's Kitchen. In Hell's Kitchen, correct. And she was there as a designated speaker because it was her city council district. She got a lot of mileage out of it. Um, and the, the plan was defeated, not because of any real work that she did. It was defeated because of Sh Sheldon Silver of Albany refused to approve the plan. And after she, beca after she became speaker, uh, Michael Bloomberg got wise to how the community could organize and defeat and possibly triangulate for support up in Albany. And when he wanted to push the Hudson Yard, I'm not the Hudson Yards project, um, the, the Brooklyn Yards project, uh, Atlantic Yards project in, in Brooklyn, he, he, Michael Bloomberg got a waiver in Albany so that all that redevelopment and rezoning could take place without having to go through the city council process. He wasn't going to take a chance that community activists would rise up and help defeat that project. And he got that waiver. And Speaker Quinn, she, she allowed it. She, she enabled Michael Bloomberg to go around the system to deny people to have any input. There was a lot of litigation around that project, but essentially, Michael Bloomberg learned to, that he had to, in order for him to get his way, he had to deny people any participation in, in the decision-making process, and Christine Quinn allowed it. Right, there, there was much, there was much, much more to that. But it, but real sellout, but the real sellout that she made a major It's certainly the way she represents it is not the way it happened. 
but that that misrepresentation of her time still makes it into the front page of the New York Times as the truth. It's up to us to call them out on it. So, I mean, I think everybody who's in here, I recognize you from some place or another. You know what it's like when, um, as an activist, when you see something that's wrong, you have to speak out. It doesn't take much, trust me. If, if a blog or a YouTube is too much of a commitment, get on Twitter. Twitter is only 140 characters or less. It still gives you a platform to speak out and say, I don't believe this. Or you're not telling me the whole truth. Trust me, Twitter is a very powerful tool. Um, my One of my Twitter accounts, the Stop Christine Clinton Twitter account, uh, it, it used to rank higher than it does now. You know, I've done a lot, I've done too many tweeting, um, I've broken too many rules with that account. My Twitter account no longer ranks as high as it used to be. But it still does what it, I needed to do. Um, I don't spend but a few minutes on it if, I, if I'm too busy. If I have more time, I can spend more time on it. But everybody here can, can start a Twitter account. Trust me, and you can tweet. This is Christine Quinn's middle class video. It's full of lies. Like, and you can call her out on it and tweet it to her directly. That's what I use my Twitter account for. I tweet things directly at her to let her know I, you know, we're, I'm out here and I know what the truth is. You know, um, we, we we all have that power within us to, to speak out. Um, you know, Christine Quinn uses uh, one last comment, and then I'll get to you. There's a question. Um, you know, Christine Quinn denies us our, our voice because she makes people live in fear of, of her retribution. The more people who speak out, you know, she won't be able to get back at all of us. It's, a, it's physically impossible. So the more people who join us, the safer it is for, for, for the rest of us. But also, it's empowering because she's denying you participation. It's up to you to say, I want to participate in my own government. I want to have a say. No one should be denying you a voice in what happens in this government. Um, Lewis, could you talk a little bit about the machine that she's built? I call her Boss Quinn, but that whole liberal machine, many of them out politicians, uh, Glick used to not be part of it, now she's a part of it. What does that really represent, in, not in terms of gay politics, but in terms of city politics? Could you repeat what you said again? For sure. Um, I don't know what time is it. I don't want to go too long, but maybe this will be the last question. It's a complicated Jim question. Is okay, this will be the last question. Um, Jim asked me to, to kind of go over the structure of Christine Quinn's power. Um, how, you know, how, are there other politicians uh, in her sphere of influence who, uh, who operate in the city? What does that mean for us, not only within the LGBT community, but for everybody else in this city? Remember, Speaker Quinn came into power as um, Tom Dwayne's campaign manager. And I, d I didn't read that section for you here, but it's, it is in volume one. It's for the end of chapter two. Uh, that city council district was redrawn in order to elect an LGBT politician in the 1991 election. So when Christine Quinn was tasked to be Tom Dwayne's campaign manager, it was, it was predetermined Tom Dwayne was going to win, basically. So it was a very easy job for Christine. She just needed to turn people out. She just needed to get people excited, and she just needed to turn people out. And Tom Dwayne won. And that was the beginning of a power structure that began with Tom Dwayne. Under, under him, he helped Christine Quinn come into power. It was with, her, with, with his assistance that he ran for office up in Albany, and he basically handed her the office that she has now which is the same city council district seat that Tom Drayton has had. Under Christine Quinn, we have this 
patronage system of you do something for me, I do something for you. And under that system, she's brought up other LGBT politicians. One that I looked to with a lot of suspicion nowadays is Brad Wellman. Another one that's coming under a lot of criticism is Corey Johnson. He's running for the city council district seat that Christine Flynn is vacating. Um, there, are, there are other people like this who are learning from the example that Christine Flynn sets in our community about how the business of our city is conducted, which is under this favoritism system, you do something for me, I do something for you, uh, or this machine-style politics where I'm the boss and you have to do what I do, otherwise you'll, you'll feel my wrath or you, you know, you will be punished or... Um, but that's, what, that's, that's, that's the tone that she's setting for us. Um, and it's up to us to say that's not acceptable. And remember, that, and I know this is within the LGBT community, but is, is this what we wanted liberation for? Is this what we wanted equality for? For our leaders to 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 come into power under this faulty system of of government, where pe it's not what the people want, but the the favors that get traded on in, in the back room, in the back rooms that determines how our city is run. One 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 great example of this, I think it was last week. You, you may have to correct me, but week before, Brad Wilman was going to. Um, apply a plaque outside of Stonewall Inn. And Brad Wellman did this unilaterally. He was he had not consulted any of the Stonewall veterans. None of the Stonewall veterans who still live today were even going to participate in that um, plaque ceremony. It was going to be all about whoever had access to Brad Wellman was going to participate. Or whoever Brad Wellman decided unilaterally was going to be involved, those were going to be the people that were going to and the community was going to have no say. Again, that's the kind of behavior that Brad Wilman is now conducting himself and conducting his office around. Who sets that tone for him? His staff is Tom Dwayne's staff. His, his staff is Tom Dwayne's staff. His staff includes Christine Prince, first girlfriend, Laura Morrison. Who sets all this tone in this city? It's Christine Quinn. There's, there, it runs really deep. She sets the tone in this city through so many political offices. It, it's a lot to talk about, um, and I don't want to overwhelm you, but suffice it to say, I think we all find ourselves here today because somewhere in our lives, we felt betrayed by Christine Quinn to such a degree we took it upon ourselves to become activists because we want to we want to see the city go in a different direction. That's why we're all here tonight. I really thank you for coming out.